our next speaker, Michael Ball, is the guru of that process, um, and I'm happy to introduce him. Uh, Michael joined the Empire State Development in October 2012 as the Western New York Deputy, Deputy Regional Director. Michael assists in the management of Empire State Development's Buffalo-based Western New York Regional Office and its efforts to recruit new business, as well as support existing business and communities. In Allegheny, Cattaraugus, Chautauqua, Erie, and Niagara counties, he is also charged with the implementation of the Western New York Regional Economic Development Council and the Buffalo Billion Strategic Incent Initiatives. Welcome, Michael Ball. Great, good afternoon. Thanks, Kath. I think it's officially uh, the first time I've ever been introduced as a guru of anything, so I just want to manage everybody's expectations. Um, it's really great to be here um, because I really spent most of my uh, professional career working for and in the nonprofit world uh, with anchor institutions and in the community, um, so it's, it's really exciting and um, somewhat, you know, nostalgic and sad for me uh, to be sitting here be, and just hearing all of the great work because I miss it so much. Um, but the, the reason why I moved into the, uh, and accepted um, an opportunity to move into the public sector, now I'm the government guy, um, is because I really felt that what was happening um, at the state level in particular uh, was really uh, trying to help much of the work that you're doing um, moving the region forward, and at least trying to come up with some creative uh, opportunities and solutions for addressing many of the challenges uh, that are being addressed today in what can often be a very rigid and uh, programmatic type of environment. Um, so today I just want to spend some time talking a little bit about uh, what's happening with the Regional Economic Development Council uh, and Empire State Development. Um, and really what the governor put in place back in 2011, um, which ultimately uh, was to result in a more localized decision-making process when it came to how we make our economic development dollars accessible, how we decide where we're going to spend them, how they're gonna be prioritized, and how we're gonna make sure that the funding uh, is making a difference. So I think it's fitting uh, that the conference is called From the Ground Up because um, the Regional Economic Development Council uh, developed a plan, the plan that they call uh, Strategy for Prosperity, which really tries to look at the fundamental um, and grassroots uh, changes and enablers uh, that are going to help us move our, move our economy forward. And, you know, we just started putting this new slogan on our side, it's called the New Western New York, because I think um, hopefully many of you feel, feel the energy, uh, there's a new excitement, I feel like there's a new faith in the region of Western New York that things are going in the right direction, um, that you know, we have opportunities and it's possible to uh, do many of the things that we've heard some of the speakers here talk about in other parts of the country. Um, but I think we also recognize that there's a lot more work to do. Um, how many people here are familiar when I say Regional Economic Development Council and CFA? Okay, good. All right, so less than half the room. So I'll spend a few minutes on this. Um, so I work for Empire State Development. We're the state uh, economic development agency. Uh, we are charged with staffing uh, the Regional Economic Development Council. Um, I don't know if we have any REDC members in the room here uh, today. Um, there was a representative from uh, Push Buffalo, so Aaron Bartley is on the regional council. The governor put regional councils in place across the state. Um, for our purposes, there are 10 economic development regions. We're Western New York. It's Allegheny, Cattaraugus, Chautauqua, um, Niagara County, and Cat County. Um, those 30 members on the regional council represent a cross-section of <clears throat> industry sectors, uh, so we have manufacturers, we have the agricultural community, we have the nonprofit community, we have the um, elected officials, and we have the private sector, all working together um, to help create and implement this new unified, localized uh, system for economic development. The first charge of that group was to develop a plan. 
um, a plan that would be used to establish our goals for the region, but also be used as a tool uh, that would request and require that all economic development statewide resources align uh, with this plan. And I mentioned at the beginning that here at the regional level, you know, we're focused on core fundamentals uh, that are gonna help drive the economy. So the regional council here established three, three core strategies that I'll talk about more in the presentation. Smart growth, so what are we doing to invest in our existing infrastructure, our existing town and village centers? Uh, we'll talk about how that clearly aligns with our poverty mission. Um, workforce development, So workforce development, um, what are we doing? I heard references um, earlier today to pipeline development. What are we doing to address the mismatch between um, the skills that uh, our residents and um, our employee, employee base has with really what the skills uh, that industry requires? What are we doing to address that and making sure that people have access to jobs and that the jobs are there? Um, and then fostering a culture of entrepreneurship um, we spent a lot of resources and have a tremendous wealth of um, research. We have a lot of academic institutions. What are we doing to make sure that that research uh, is commercialized and that we're creating opportunities for new, new businesses? Um, so this plan came about throughout a very extensive uh, public input process, um, trying to reach every area of the region, all those counties. So through a very extensive uh, public input process. Um, those strategies were developed, the plan was put in place, um, work groups were put in place, some ex many of which exist today, um, to really make sure that we were putting in place a, a plan that um, was not only appropriate and adequate, but that had the buy-in uh, of people in the region. And the council also set up uh, some parameters for how we're gonna make decisions. So again, I think in a community um, that has experienced um, a lot of great planning, a lot of great plans and strategies that sit on shelves and aren't put into action, you know, what were we gonna do to make sure that this was a living document and one that we truly could use um, as a uh, litmus test for how we're gonna invest in projects and track them. And there were three, three essentials for all projects. Does it create, retain, or fill jobs? After all, this is, this is happening within the economic development framework. Uh, jobs is always at the forefront. Are we maximizing our return on investment? These are public dollars. How are we making sure that um, we're being responsible with those dollars uh, and that we can demonstrate a return on that investment? And is what we're investing in ready for implementation? Knowing that some projects, you know, many of which we talked about today, <clears throat> some of these projects take a long time. And we're there to help throughout that process, but sometimes when it comes time to earmarking very scarce resources, we just wanna make sure that those dollars aren't tied up when there's other projects that are ready to go. So the projects should be relatively ready uh, for implementation. And then we wanna make sure that they're inclusive, you know, we're promoting smart growth, that they're oriented to young adults, the largest segment of our population uh, that we've lost over the last few years? Are we building on our strength? Is what we're investing in having a regional impact? And does it improve the region's image? I talked about the core strategies, um, but to make sure and to continue to reflect the diverse economy we have here um, and building on our strengths, you know, we want to invest in advanced manufacturing, agriculture, take advantage of our bi-national location with Canada. We wanna focus on ener energy and energy innovations, health and life sciences, a very strong sector here, professional um, services, and then tourism. So why the emphasis on smart growth? And actually I think I'm probably preaching to the choir here, um, but clearly we all know uh, that we've had uh, we have a region that's experienced a uh, decline in population. And unfortunately, the largest population that we've lost is our young people. So we want to recognize that and make sure that we're developing a strategy and investing in projects that will help us address that. 
So when we talk about smart growth, it's investing in our existing villages and town centers. Um, it's ex investing in brownfields. How do we put property uh, that was once at the core um, of this region's success but is now fallow and often a liability for us? How do we put that back on the tax rolls? Um, so we're investing in projects like Riverbend, you know, the Solar City project, you know, making sure that that brownfield um, site was ready. And when that investment took place, there wasn't a solar city. But when Solar City came along, uh, the property was ready. Um, we're working with Niagara County on many of the brownfields here and working with um, Erie County on the Bethlehem Steel site. And then we're working with um, many of the villages and town centers, whether it's Olean, Springville, Lockport, I think Chuck Bell's here from Lockport, and the city of North Tonawanda to find out how we can help them in their revitalization efforts uh, within their existing commercial corridors so that we're, again, investing in the areas that are accessible uh, for the people who need access to jobs, um, where we've already invested historically in infrastructure, um, rather than continuing um, the uh, the, um, continuing to invest in new infrastructure that we can no longer uh, afford. And then in the Buffalo Billion Initiative, um, just to touch on that briefly, so again, investing in sort of key employment hubs uh, in the city of Buffalo, but much of the, these investments are, are, le are leading to hundreds and hundreds of jobs um, we're looking at employment. We're looking at access to those jobs, transportation, making sure that while many of those investments are taking place in the city of Buffalo, whether it's Solar City, whether it's IBM, um, whether it's the Advanced Manufacturing Institute on the east side, um, but that those programs, the policies surrounding them, um, are going to benefit uh, the region as a whole. I talked about preparing our workforce. Um, it's not always the truth that there's no jobs uh, in Buffalo, but through a lot of the work that we've done with the Regional Council in preparing the strategies, um, and especially now with the focus on workforce within the Buffalo Billion Initiatives, is that we're learning from industry leaders that there are jobs, um, but that there's a mismatch in the skills that are out there. Um, And that 50% of our unemployed workers um, have a high school diploma uh, or less. So some of the training programs, so we're working with Erie One BOCES, uh, the Buffalo Public Schools, um, the community colleges, so Erie Community College, Jamestown Community Colleges, um, the Finishing Trades Institute, um, to work on pipeline development, you know, making the resources available, um, putting the forum in place whereby um, industry is brought together uh, with the training programs that are in place and offering a resources to help make sure that the, the right training is in place for the jobs that are needed. Um, and we've learned that we need to start that process sooner. Uh, so we're investing in programs like uh, Dream It, Do It, which is designed to <coughs> expose our young people. And when we say young people in this context, it's K through 12 to some of the opportunities. Um, in this case, there's a high focus on advanced manufacturing. You know, what we've learned is that there are, <clears throat> manufacturing is still uh, one of the largest sectors in our economy, but over time, um, the manufacturing, manufacturing has not been as appealing uh, to our young people and hasn't been promoted as much as it could. So trying to change the image of of manufacturing from one that was dirty, dark, and unappealing to what we know now is more of the advanced manufacturing in the high tech sector. Like I said, working with the community colleges, um, in this case, Department of Labor um, provided resources for Jamestown Community College to train the long-term unemployed in careers in drafting and mechanical engineering and making sure that you know, all three, so Jamestown Community Colleges has a campus um, in Olean, in Dunkirk, uh, and in Jamestown. 
So two years ago, uh, the governor rolled out uh, an initiative uh, and something that he asked the regional councils to look at, and that was the opportunity agenda, feeling that we still weren't doing enough to address some of the other issues, many of which we're talking about today, um, facing uh, the underserved community and things that are still getting in the way of access to jobs. So while we've made the investments in companies, we made the inv investments in hard capital, uh, um, in infrastructure, in our communities, there's still, you know, there still needs to be a lot done. Um, so the regional council here decided to focus on, again, underscoring the need for education and training. Education, so working with the public transportation providers, uh, looking at our infrastructure, what's, what's getting in the way of people getting to jobs, um, and then foundational supports for success. So while these aren't new to many of us in the room, some of these are actually new concepts in the economic development framework. There hasn't been a lot of conversation in the past about daycare, um, about affordable housing close to employment hubs, um, access to healthy food in our communities. Those are conversations that are now taking place at a higher level and with greater emphasis um, at the Regional Economic Development Council and then pushed forward uh, up to Albany. <clears throat> Roger Woodworth is here from the One Stop, uh, Veterans One Stop in Buffalo, and Roger, um, and many of the other leaders on the Regional Economic Development Council helped us put together a strategy for how we can better align the work that we're doing <clears throat> in a way that uh, helps our veteran community. And what we realize is that we have a great model uh, in the One Stop Center that, in Buffalo, but that we really need to take that model and all the services that they provide and take it across our, our, our region so working with Roger, working with County Executive Vince Horrigan in Chautauqua County, uh, we're looking at a way that we can uh, expand that model into the southern tier. So I talked about uh, entrepreneurship, and we've spent, we have a great wealth of uh, higher educational institutions here, um, a lot of research that has been invested, that where public dollars have been invested but we haven't necessarily seen that transform um, into, um, into companies or companies that stay here. So we recognize that if we're going to continue the investment uh, in smart growth and in our existing towns and village centers, um, if we're gonna improve the pipeline by making opportunities available for young people, and if we're going to have an environment here that retains our educated young people, we also need to improve our culture, and our ecosystem uh, for entrepreneurship. This is just another slide that shows where our region aligns with patent output, which is another way that we can measure how many companies are started here uh, um, through the research taking place. So one of the ways that we've tried to get at that is uh, the state has a number of um, innovation funds. So in the past, uh, we often would uh, invest in a venture capital fund locally or regionally uh, that would then make investments um, in companies. We still do that, but now we have a $50 million fund at the state level where we can now make those investments directly in companies. And through the Buffalo Billion Initiative, um, we launched uh, the world's largest business plan competition. So it was identified through that planning process and meeting with the community that um, we need to do something big. If we were going to convince the rest of the world that Buffalo was a place where you can not only start your business but keep it here, or to attract a business here, we were going to have to come out with a big splash. We have to change the way that people think about Western New York as a place for innovation. So <clears throat> we say it's the world's largest business plan competition because it had a million dollar prize. And then there were uh, two half a million dollar prizes and three or four $250,000 prizes. So last year was the first year. Um, <clears throat> we now have six companies uh, that are here in Western New York from all over the world. Uh, there were 7,000 applications in the 43 North Business Plan competition, which really demonstrated that with the right message, 
Um, with the right carrot, uh, we could gain the interest um, of entrepreneurs globally. And then, as we all say all the time, once we got them here, uh, it was an easy sell. So part of the hook was not the prize, but it was also the requirements that came along with it. So as a, as a finalist in that competition, not, not just if you won one of those large cash, pri cash prizes, but if you were one of the 12 finalists, you had to move your company to Western New York, and you had to keep your company here for at least a year. So uh, a very successful program. Like I said, those companies are now uh, in Buffalo. They're located in space on the Buffalo Niagara Medical Campus. And what was also attractive was that we provided wraparound services. So not only were you gonna move your company here, but you were gonna have access to a lot of different services, a lot of different mentors and other resources to help you make your business successful. Another way we're trying to get at the issue of entrepreneurship uh, is the governor rolled out the Startup New York program. Again, really leveraging uh, this wealth of higher educational institutions. Um, Niagara University actually um, recently had their Startup New York plan accepted. So Niagara University is now part of the Startup New York program. Really a very innovative model, one that's being looked at across the country and bringing together the academic world and our private companies, um, leveraging all the resources that are at these institutions, coupled with the opportunities for um, students to work at the companies um, and for the companies to uh, grow within the footprint at the institution. So, so what this does too is it really puts the institutions in the economic development driver's seat. So never really have we looked at them as, as a core player in the economic development world, yet we've been in making all these investments in the institutions and they're doing great work. Um, so companies that are accepted into the Startup New York program pay no state taxes. They don't pay real estate tax. They don't pay income tax. Whoa, are you okay? Um, so they don't pay any state taxes, and their uh, employees don't pay tax. So not only are we helping them, um, we're helping them attract employees, and we're helping put them in a position uh, where they can grow uh, and benefit from being aligned. So the company needs to align with the, univer with the university or with that college. So SUNY schools are eligible. Um, as well as the private schools uh, like Niagara University. So in the past where we would have just given capital grants to company ABC to build a new facility, hire new employees, we're also trying to get a little more creative um, with our funding so that it benefits more than one company or a one-off. And so what we've started to do uh, more aggressively is make investments in other funding mechanism. So in this case, um, working with Southern Tier West, which was, is the Metropolitan Planning Organization in the Southern Tier part of our region, has helped them create a loan fund. So a lot of companies uh, in Western New York that have been here for a long time, their challenge isn't getting empo good employees, their challenge isn't expanding their footprint or getting new customers, it's replacing really old equipment. You go into a lot of the companies in this region, um, because we have this very long legacy, um, especially in manufacturing here, and really their biggest challenge is replacing that piece of equipment, um, which in many cases could be holding them back. So learning that through many of, the, many of the regional economic development work groups and the Buffalo Billion work groups is we created a loan fund um, that oftentimes provides capital that they can't get from a commercial lender. So is any of this making a difference? Um, I know I went through this really quickly, and we could spend a lot of time on each one of these strategies, um, but when we look at whether or not any of this is making a difference, after, so since 2011, when the Regional Economic Development Council was put into place, um, so far we've awarded just under $800 million in state funding. That's leveraged almost $3 billion in private investment 
helped us hold on to at least 12,000 jobs and helped us create more than 7,000 jobs. And one of the ways that you can access this funding, and I didn't really include any slides on that because we could spend a lot of time on that, um, is through something called the Consolidated Funding Application. So in addition to localizing the way that we make these decisions at the state level, coupled with that was something called the CFA, the Consolidated Funding Application. So in the past, you would have went to each of our state agencies individually, whether it was a parks project, whether it was a housing project. Um, they'd have their own application, their own application process. Um, now there's one application, one annual solicitation that usually opens up in the spring. So the fifth round of the CFA will open up probably in May or June. Applications are due usually by the end of July, and then awards are made by the end of the year in December. So what that's done is created a very predictable process. We have a plan that lays out the criteria, um, a, a very predictable time frame, um, and really allows a project many opportunities to get the funding they need for implementation because many of the state agencies can take a look at that project at the same time. And those projects, before they're even reviewed by the state agency, are reviewed and scored at the local level by our Regional Economic Development Council. And that score carries a lot of weight as to whether or not the state agency is gonna fund it. So it's a, a process that in its fifth year coming up has proven successful. It's not perfect, it's still government funding, um, but yet it's really helped us um, be involved in the funding process and helped us keep track of how those projects are doing. And again, in the spirit of measuring our, our progress, we're happy that three of the big indicators, uh, when you look at economic statistics at the regional level, are going in the right direction. Jobs have gone up, total wages are going up, the number of firms uh, is going up, but again, we also know that there's, there's a lot of work uh, to be done. So with that, I'll end, and then I'd be happy to answer any questions. Anybody? Yes. Right, so I think actually we heard in some of the earlier presentations some references um, to the way the manufacturing used to be. Um, safe to say that manufacturing today requires less of a labor force, um, but what we're, what we're finding out is that um, the wages can be high, um, um, but also that, uh, that the skill set um, can be also highly advanced. Um, so. Um, these are good jobs in most cases, um, and manufacturing is still one of the largest employers in our region. So while the number of firms may have gone down in the past, we're starting to see that go up, um, and the number of people that each of them employs, um, they're highly paid jobs, um, and they're highly skilled jobs, which is why we're putting a lot of resources into making sure that in our educational ecosystem, we're putting the right training in place so that people can take advantage of those jobs. Because what we're hearing also too is that there's an employment cliff that is looming. That if our manufacturers don't get better access to the employment that they need, you know, we could have a problem on our hands where they might have to leave the region altogether. So um, does that answer your question? Thank you. In the back. Yep, no, you're absolutely right. And um, if I had more time, I would have gone through a lot of projects. And I should have put something on there. So um, 
So the trades are very involved in this process. And actually, we've, so, uh, we've made partnerships and investments in those training programs um, and in those fields. Because again, those are, those are good jobs. Um, not everybody is going to go to college. We recognize that. Um, so we've made investments in, um, in the plumber, with the plumbers union and their training facility, um, welding. Uh, so there's a lot of resources going into uh, training programs um, that help us train people in, in the welding industry because we know that there's a lot of demand there. So no, absolutely, it's not just, um, and I'm sorry if that's the message that came across, it's not just, just the person who's going to go to college that we're focused on. I think, Right. No. <laughs> right. Right. So there's, yeah, thanks, Kathy. So, but to that, no, I mean, and um, despite the Buffalo Billion being focused on the city and you're hearing a lot about Buffalo, actually there is a, a large portion of that Buffalo Billion going towards Niagara Falls specific projects. So working closely with uh, the city of Niagara Falls, I think Seth is here, Picarello, working with Seth, um, working with our subsidiary USA Niagara, um, there's a lot of the Buffalo Billion that's been set aside to make investments in the city of Niagara Falls, um, both in the state park, um, but also in the city itself. So, um, right, this is a strategy that's intended to help the, uh, the entire region. And something that we do recognize is that Buffalo often gets many of the, many of the headlines. And so actually many of the images and a lot of the projects that truthfully we, we talk about, if I had more time, often do focus on the areas outside of Erie County because we, we recognize that that gets a lot of the attention in the media. So I'd be happy to talk offline too more about Niagara Falls and Niagara County. Yes. Yeah, no, I wouldn't say, I wouldn't say that, that that's necessarily the case. Um, I think that uh, Buffalo became a focus. Um, in this case, if we're talking about the Buffalo Billion, being the largest city in the region, um, recognize the fact that if, you know, if Buffalo isn't doing well, the rest of the region isn't gonna do well. So um, I think that was one of the main drivers, but along with that, there was a strong emphasis to make sure that those hubs and those initiatives in Buffalo would have a regional impact. Um, but like I said, we're working very closely with Mayor Deister, uh, his administration, the mayor's on the Regional Economic Development Council, so he's right there at the table. Um, but uh, no, I think as a general note though, um, clearly, you know, communities, um, projects, organizations that have a plan in place, um, that have community buy-in, uh, that have some support already lined up um, are going to uh, fare better in the CFA process the way that I've described the way decisions are made. Um, but here in Niagara County and in the city of Niagara Falls, we have a lot of great partners that are working closely with the process. Yes. Yes, so uh, good question. So uh, the question was, you know, do we hold companies accountable for the funding and assistance they receive? 
Uh, yes, we do, and actually that's a process that cha has changed over the last few years to get exactly probably why you're asking. Um, so the way that our funding works is, that, is um, it's almost all on a reimbursement basis. So in other words, you need to finish the project before you get the funding from us. That's the same rule that applies whether you're a, um, a community doing a streetscape and infrastructure project or if your company ABC who received funding to build a new plant and to buy equipment and hire employees. Um, at the time in which you can demonstrate that you've hired those employees, and that you've made the investment, then you get the funding from us. So while we might approve what we call an incentive, so we refer to these all as incentives because it is an incentive for you to do the project. Um, we don't have, we have very few opportunities for what you'd call carry out funding, where we would give you the money to then go do the project. We recognize that that presents challenges oftentimes for smaller companies. So we try to work with commercial lenders and other funding opportunities to make a bridge. Uh, so if a company needs that funding so they can buy the equipment right away, there's opportunities for bridge funding, but um, to receive the state funded taxpayer supported dollars, you need to complete the process for project first. Does that answer? Yeah, it's different for, I mean, in most cases with the IDAs, it's like that as well. Um, if you're talking about tax benefits, um, it can be a little bit different. So in our case, the same rule applies. If a company receives tax credits, um, they only get those tax credits at the end of the year when they can prove that they created the jobs that go along with that benefit. So that's why we refer to them as incentives. Anybody else? Great. Well, thank you. Oh, one more? So the question was, uh, so I think in reference to the Startup New York, so in Startup New York, right, new employees, um, so company can't move, the company here can't move into a startup zone and can't move on to the Niagara University campus from somewhere else in the city of Niagara Falls um, and just give those benefits to all their existing employees. So I just, it's an important uh, point to make. Um, it, we're talking about 10 years, Max. So um, there's an agreement, though, that is developed with the school uh, that outlines all of those benefits what their growth plans are. Um, but again, that, that would be only for its new companies with new employees or, an, or a company with a new division that will hire new employees. Anybody else? Great, well, I'll be around for the rest of the day if anybody has any questions. Thank you.